We're back for another podcast and we're talking about Cincinnati. There's been a lot of controversies. There's been a lot of big exits of big players early on. We've got Medvedev out. Ad Kalaz has just gone out the other day. Draper went through against Felix, but it was very controversial. And today we're going to talk about it all. That's right, we're back again. Cincinnati is, well, proving to be one of these tournaments, which is throwing up the upsets and throwing up some great tennis at the same time. I've been shocked by some of the results that we've seen on the men's and the women's side, but I think I've been more shocked about some of these dodgy umpiring and electronic line calling decisions that we've been seeing throughout the tournament and let's just get straight stuck into it the first uh, thing we're going to talk about is last night's match well in the UK it is uh, Jack Draper who went through again well done to him but he went through in controversy against Felix Oja Aliassime and it was match point and something crazy I don't think I've ever seen before it was right in front of the umpire he's hit the ball into the floor and won the point. And uh, the umpire has just given him the match. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like it before. It's causing a lot of uh, problems over on social media. There's a lot of people speaking out about it. Sissipas has posted it saying, oh my. But let's just get straight stuck into it, shall we, JG? Yeah, yeah, best place to start, and that is the title of today's video. Everyone's speaking about it on social media. And this is me and Ben's take of the events of what's just happened, of course. Uh, don't want to take anything away from Draper's performance, no. nor Felix. Felix has had a fantastic week. He beat, who did he beat in the round before who was really impressive, I thought. Uh, I'll let you have a look, but I remember yeah. watching a bit of it. He was brilliant in that Kasper one. Casper Ruud. Casper Ruud, fantastic. He, he played there. And he's actually had a good few weeks, Felix. Um, yeah, Draper bad. also just beaten Sissipas and has now beaten Felix as well. And we got to see some good tennis on very fast courts, as, as Draper was talking about in his post-match interview. But everyone was talking about one incident, and that was on match point of all points. The chair umpire is Gregory Allensworth, who, let's be fair, I've seen more images of him than some of the highlights of tennis in Cincinnati this fortnight mm. because there's been loads of incidents. We had the one with Taylor Fritz, um, there was another one as well, which was quite bad. And this is probably the, 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 the pick of the bunch because it was on match point. Yeah. And it quite clearly hits the floor first. So the incident for people who don't know, Jack's shot hits the ground. So if you just go back, I'll just read in the, the bit. Oh, apologies. Uh, so Jack Jack's shot hits the ground before going over the net. Felix said he shanked it on the floor. The umpire said he didn't see it. And it's the third mistake in two weeks. And the players pay for it. And if you just go to the video, we're not gonna allowed to show it, but you can clearly see the ball. Well, it hits the frame, bounces into the floor, and then goes into the sort of the the the, the middle of the racket and goes over the net. Just just about, by the way, hits the top of the net cord, bounces over. Nothing Felix can do about it. But I understand a few different variables. When, when you're playing high-speed tennis, it's not even like our level of amateur tennis, which is a little slower and you can maybe see it easier. When the ball's travelling at this speed, it often is difficult to know what's happening in real time. But I am no experienced chair umpire. One thing I would say is when you see the trajectory of a ball in the way it went here, you just know yeah. something's not quite right because it's impossible for a ball to travel in the way it did without be it being any foul play. And I think that's what you should be focusing on rather than trying to spot it in real time. If you just see something which just looks very strange and bizarre, considering this guy is very experienced, I think he's very full, uh, he's a big, he's an ATP bigwig. I was reading an article. Uh, Gregory Allensworth goes the name. He's an American umpire, self-employed. Employed. He's one of the 33 gold badge chair umpires, the highest certification for the joint certificate certificate program by ATP, WTA and ITF and Grand Slams. So you can't get any better of an umpire. You'd think you'd have a bit of common sense to see if the ball goes in that trajectory, something's not quite right with the way it was hit, despite how fast it was. Yeah, I mean, it clearly uh, wasn't a natural action for no. a ball to be travelling over the net. And I know that there's a lot of people who are against this, but we're in the day of 
electronic line calling for a contentious decision like this, surely it's as quick. They show a replay on TV within about a, a millisecond. Why, why doesn't he just have that on his a little screen? He's got a screen there. Why He gets the, the line calling one. Why isn't there just a quick replay and it just in slow motion he just goes, oh yeah, that's wrong, right? We either replay the point or it's not his point. Or fit. There's any any number of things he could have done there other than say, game, set, match. That was the okay. one thing he shouldn't have done there. <laughs> this is my take on it. As you said, commentators, as they're commentating on this match, they have full access, just like we do at home, to the slow down version of the incident as it happens right then and there. We have the technology now. We've got so many cameras there. It's clear. So we was able to see this image, this image about a minute afterwards of it happening. I think what should happen is rather than like a VAR with an independent panel away from the court in another room making decisions based off what's happening on the court, I believe the umpire himself should have access to the footage in that moment. So a minute after, I think the players should not allow to be anywhere near the umpire. Not even a they minute. Should have to either they should have to be sitting by their chair, sitting in their chairs or by the baseline or no one, nowhere near. And if they are to interfere while the umpire is making the decision, then it should be completely void and then they've got no, no say in it at all. And it goes against you if you are someone who's going to be over there speaking to the umpire and the thing. I think it loses respect. I think players have lost so much respect as it is for umpires and it's only going to get worse. They should be the most powerful person on the tennis court in terms of you, you you respect them a lot. Their decision is final. That's not the case anymore. Even Felix is saying, can you not just try and change it? Like, change it now. Draper's saying, I don't mind playing it again. It's, it's a mess. It's an yeah. absolute mess the way it is right now. And it can easily sort it out. The umpire has access, looks at his screen. He then makes a the decision in real time. And if he would have seen the, the imagery we saw, he would have known that you needed to replay that point. And it wasn't fair for Draper to win that point and win the match based off that. However, he, he they don't have that facility. They don't call the, whoever it is, down. What's his name? The other guy. I don't know. It's like, this is the like tournament, tournament director or someone? Isn't yeah, it? Wh tournament whoever it is. And he's there. And he's basically saying, I, I don't know what to say. And, it, and, he, and then Dr he got... Um, <laughs> Draper asking him, what do you think of the incident? He's like, oh, well, everyone's scared to say their opinion. And it's just a complete mess involving all these different people. They never get to the right decision. That Taylor Fritz one earlier in the week was terrible. Yeah. It was so far out. Everyone knew it was out, but you've got automatic line calling, but apparently it fouled. Well, they've changed if, the if, rules if, now. If, even if it sound. fouls, like surely the umpire can, everyone could see that one in real time, yeah. despite it being fast. This one I can understand. To the naked eye in real time, where tennis is played at that speed, you can easily miss it. And there's going to be people saying, oh, no, it was so obvious. It's only obvious because you've seen it so many times and we've seen it in slow motion. In real time, it's difficult. It is You can easily miss that one. I think there was a tweet from someone saying, oh, uh, a tennis ball so small. We'll bring nice that one well. up. Here we go. So the end of the Felix Draper match was unfortunate. But I think everyone should know better than to, to shit on chair umpires at this point. Blame the lack of video review, whatever. But human error is always going to be the thing in a high sport, speed sport with a small ball. Definitely. The difference is the chair umpires, I think, should be making some better decisions in moments. Definitely with the Taylor Fritz one. They need to oh, overrule that. It's very clear. In this one... You need to use a little bit of common sense, the trajectory of the ball. You might not have seen it in real time, but the way the ball went, you're like, mm, something's not quite right. Replay the point. Or the best solution out of all of these is they need to have some support with technology, but I don't want it to be a slow down VAR in an independent room with independent umpires making decisions separate to the court or the tournament. It needs to be done in real time, then and there, and it needs to be very quick. And if you're not sure then you can't, you can't give it. It needs to be something you're certain and sure. This is one of them ones. If you, if you look at the video, you're just certain that it's, it's, uh, it's not fair. It hits hit the floor first. It's obvious. It is pretty clear. The Fritz one, I think that the umpire just completely just ruined the match just by saying... It's the same umpire, by the way. But he, yeah, he started saying to Fritz that he was the one who should have challenged it. Like They said, oh, you shouldn't have kept playing. That's why you, we, I'm continuing as if it was in. What? You, but like he I said, said I this thought is it was a very a, experienced very, umpire. So very weird, the, maybe the, the last part of everything is they need to really look at some of the umpires they have employed 
and give them the necessary training and maybe confidence to make the right decision because it seems to me they're a little bit erratic. I feel like they're nervous because they're not respected. And I think that's just created, it's made it worse. When someone's not respected, I think they're under them more pressure and they make more wrong decisions. And well, I think maybe. if they were in a in a position of power where they were respected and what they said was final and they had that kind of authority, I feel like they would then make better decisions. But that's just my view. Well, let us know in the comments section what your view on this uh, whole scenario was and tell us what do you think should have been the outcome of the decision? Should they have just continued like the umpire said or should it have been replayed or should the point have just gone to Felix? I mean, there's a lot of options here. Tell us what you think should have been done in the comments section. I want to hear what everybody has to say on this matter. Yeah. And what would you say? Replay the point? You wouldn't give the point to Felix, surely? It just, uh, I would say... As there's so much controversy over it, I'd say because you've had to go all of this way, like, and there's been minutes passed, I'd say have a let and then play it again. But and if it was in real time and you had that technology and you had that that slowing down, like a slow motion, obviously it's not going to be Jack Draper's point. It's not going to be uh, a let. It's going to be Felix's point. Yeah, and mm, I don't know. It's, I feel it's, like... it's it's very it's a it's a grey area because he's already given the point to Draper. Can you swap it and then give it to Felix, or do you have to play the let? No, it, mate, it has to be a let. So, so that's what In I mean. Opinion, like it a... has to be a let. Do it again, and that's what Draper was kind of saying as well. Um, Draper wasn't sure, and he kept emphasising, "Oh, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure." And Maybe Felix he's not was sure. Felix was saying to him, "Come on, man, you do know. Like it's every tennis player knows when they've hit hit the ground first. They know if something's not quite right." What do you think? Do you think Draper generally wasn't sure? I, th I think it's possible that he wasn't sure. Look how fast these courts are playing. They are playing super, super quick. I understand and if it... it's fast, but as Kyrgios mentioned on the issue, he even said, come on, Draper. Like, let's be <laughs> honest. We know, you know what happened. And from someone who, we play tennis ourselves, you kind of know, I, I believe. And I think Draper out of everyone would have known more than anyone. Because you have you, the feeling, you can you can feel it. It's, it's you got this. You don't just have your eyes. You can feel the sensation of it being different. And I find it really hard to believe that Draper didn't know. I don't criticise him for not owning up to it because at the end of the day, sport is sport, and I know fair play is, is something you need to do. But if he had he wants to win, to it. he's desperate to win. It's not his responsibility. I don't. I don't. Feel, so what happens if he owns up to officiate a match? No, if he owns up, to, nothing changes, does it? So no player should ever have to officiate their own match. That's why if, we don't have it like that. Well, so it's, exactly. not, it's not, not up for him to say, but deep down, I find it very hard to believe he didn't know. What do you think? He doesn't lose anything, even if he says, yeah, I hit it into the floor, though. So that's why I don't understand why it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't change the result if he says, oh, yeah, I hit it into the floor. They don't suddenly say, oh, OK, point to Felix. They, uh, he said they he called do, the match. No, no, they, 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 they can do more so. Like if, if he was to put his hand up straight away and say, oh, I've just put, hit that into the ground, the umpire can be like, okay, calls, and they can, they, it's like fair play. And then they they do award that to Felix or, or do a let. Maybe. But in that situation, they would have awarded it to Felix. And he, if he put his hands up straight away, I think they would have awarded it to Felix. I mean, at, the, at that score line, it was 40-30 and he was about to go to juice. And if he got broken back, they're going to be at five all. Exactly. It, this this is one of the best tournaments I've seen Jack Draper, Draper play in a long time. So, I mean, I'm not mad at him for it. Um, it's the umpire's protocol Definitely. to be able to decide. I'm I'm happy that Jack's playing well. I'm sad for Felix because he's actually been playing well as well. But yeah. this is just the way it goes. And I think that this tournament is going to be an example for all the other tournaments of how not to officiate a tournament. And hopefully this is a good sign because we're coming up to the US Open. Hopefully they're taking notes right now of how not to run things because we don't want this happening when it comes to a Grand Slam. Yeah. So, Great few weeks for Felix, like you said. Beat Rude at the Olympic Games um, and then beat Medvedev as well there and followed up beating Rude again in Cincinnati. That was the results I was looking for earlier and just uh, letting you guys know. That's it. And as Draper says here, it is the fastest court I've ever played on in my life. And... It's actually suiting him down to the ground, this this surface. I mean, some of the shots he's playing, oh my word, he's absolutely battering the ball. The winners he's hitting, he's going for it. He's playing aggressive tennis and it's paying off. His serve looks brilliant as well. I think 
he could be a real problem for Holger Luna in the quarterfinals as well. Holger Luna's looking really good too. But Holger Luna had to overcome somebody who played two matches in one day and still went to three sets with Gael Monfils. But credit to Gael Monfils. I want to hear your thoughts on that next because obviously we lost Carlos Alcaraz. He went out of the tournament to, uh, in his first match. He's now lost back-to-back -back matches against 37-year-old opponents. Djokovic at the Olympics. Now Gael Monfils, who's in inspired form, looked brilliant. And I just want to get your takeaway because Alcaraz has come out and said it's the worst match he's played in his career. I think he focused too much on himself and I don't think uh, he focused enough on how well Gael Monfils played. What are your thoughts on Carlos Alcalaz. I'm very surprised he lost um, number one. I did yeah. not see it coming at all. Uh, I thought he was going to follow up that loss at the Olympics with a big statement victory. It wasn't to be. All of the sets were very close, even the one he won. And he played a really poor match of tennis. That's one thing I would agree with him. I don't know if it was his worst matches I've seen of his career. That's what he said. It was certainly one of the worst I've seen this year from him. Um, and... He just didn't look like the same player, lacking confidence, very frustrated with himself. Um, you saw what he did to his racket, completely smashed it to pieces. There were some people <laughs> saying the technique on the on the racket break was one of the best they've ever seen. It was good. He used his, his momentum. Both it went legs in one hit. On the ground. <laughs> it was very, it's a brilliant tennis. With, with Carlos Alcalaz, I feel like physically and technically he's so good that you can even admire a, 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 a racket break from him because he does it in a way which is very efficient. Um, but it still, went fast. It, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. It's not what you want to see. I don't like seeing players breaking rackets. I think there's other ways to deal with your anger. Um, but that's that's the way it went for him. And everyone, I think, will go through phases of their of their of a match or a career where they will have some some down moments and. He probably is feeling it after what happened at the Olympics. Being a big favourite, I think he believed he was going to win that match. And to lose in the way he did play him well, I think then showed him, oh, I can't just turn up and play this level and win like he always does. Mm. Um, what is What this now means for him, I'm not sure. I think the next match is so important. Yes. Because it doesn't matter who he plays, people now may try and get under his skin a little bit. And they've seen this more vulnerable side of him, which yep. makes him a little bit more beatable because players, I think, will go into the match feeling more confident. In the past, you see Carlos Alcaraz there jumping up at the net before the match starts thinking, oh God, not again. I can't be bothered to face this guy. He's just a beast. Now they're thinking, you never know, he might, he might unravel. He may do what he did against Monfils. He may not be able to find himself. And it gives them confidence to, to keep their level consistent, even if they lose the first set, even if they're down a break early in the second or whatever stage they are at the match. I think people are now going to have a little bit more belief that they can beat him. So that's only going, that's not going to, not going to help him. Uh, but let's wait and see. I think um, I am disappointed for sure. Yeah, and uh, the... the the one thing to be noted, uh, his Masters 1,000 results in the last 12 months. So Shanghai, uh, fourth round. Paris Bercy, second round. He won Indian Wells. Quarter final in Miami. Didn't play Monte Carlos there. Quite like that. <laughs> Madrid It is a quarter final. Didn't play Rome. Didn't play in Montreal. And now, a round, well, round two is actually a first match exit uh, in Cincinnati. And for anyone confused as to why he's still number three. And this is the Wimbledon and Roland Garros reigning champion at the moment, who is in danger of losing number three now if Sasha Zverev is to win Cincinnati. If you just go back to that last one, I'm trying to work out what surface is Alcaraz best on now, because we've seen in terms of hard courts, always does extremely well at Indian Wells. He looks his most comfortable at that event. It's in America and it's a slow hard court then does very well on a grass court which we mm. know are quite fast then pretty good recently on the clay courts as one role on garros looking like one of the best clay court players in the world following rafa nadal of course Djokovic is there as well with what he's done at the olympics so what is his best surface because when you hear him talking in an interview he says i love a nice fast tennis court he likes the speed he likes to play aggressive but then 
based off his results, I think sometimes they suggest the other, apart from Wimbledon. So I'm just trying to work it out. Is grass just because it's a different bounce and maybe that's why he do does so well? I would say probably he's best on a slower hard court. I like him on a slower hard court and I think that's where we see some of the best of Carlos Alcaraz. But still, we've seen, remember when he broke on the scene in Madrid? That's a fast clay yeah. court. And that was where we saw some of his best tennis then as well. So we know he's an overall great tennis player. Is it a case of he doesn't necessarily have a best surface? And he's know, pretty Mark? much the same as all of it. On all I've of it. Got, I think the reasoning for this loss, and I could be wrong, um, he just came off of the fast Wimbledon gr like grass courts. One Wimbledon, he was playing fantastically. He then went on to a slow Roland Garros court at the Olympics and then playing uh, some fantastic tennis, got to the final, did lose in the final to Djokovic. And now he's gone to the fastest ever court, which a lot of players are saying they've ever played on. So is this chopping and changing between slow, fast, slow, fast, now on the fastest hard court? He didn't adjust. I don't think he adjusted very well. And I think that, that is my reasoning for him going out early in this Cincinnati. I think Gail Monfils, I think he adjusted a lot better. He looked like someone with more experience on the tour, someone who's better at adjusting to these like changes in surfaces. And Gail Monfils, he's a really good tennis player. If you don't play your best tennis against Gail Monfils when he's playing some of his best tennis, you're likely to lose. And unfortunately... Alcaraz smashed up a racket, which sometimes helps players when they're in a moment of frustration. I think it was just a sign that he just was failing to cope with the conditions, and that was it. So maybe it is the players who played, who went far at the Olympics, are the ones who are going to struggle the most at Cincinnati. So let's test that out. So the players who got to the quarterfinal at the Olympics: Djokovic, Sissipas, Zverev, Massetti, Felix. Rude, Felix, and Paul Alcaraz. Well, Paul's been abysmal. <laughs> So that's yeah. definitely a good one. Adkaz, <laughs> similar. Don't know what happened yeah. to him. Felix looked okay because he beat Rude again. But then Rude was someone who also went quite far at the Olympics. Well, when they got both got to the quarterfinals. So who's to know there? Massetti went out, didn't he? Pretty pretty sharpish. Was it to yeah. TFO he lost to? I believe so, yeah, TFO. Uh, Zverev is still playing. So let's see if he's a bit of an anomaly. And since the past, we know lost to Draper. So it seems like everyone who did quite well at the Olympics is not doing well at Cincinnati. I think Felix... Let's see if Zverev breaks that. I think Felix is a little bit of an exception because I think he has played very well at Cincinnati. But I think his his uh, tennis suits, like obviously fast indoor hard courts. I think this is like sort of similar. Fast courts for Felix are really, really good, really suit him. So... The more fast courts there are, I think, better for Felix. That's why I think he's so much more frustrated about the loss to Draper because he was actually playing very well. He just came up against Draper playing equally as well. Maybe touch better. But, yeah, that's enough, I think, of uh, speaking about Alcalaz. Let us know your thoughts about the Alcalaz controversy, uh, the racket smash, and do you think he's going to come back with a bang at the US Open? Obviously, he's won it before. But these are the quarterfinals we've got on the men's side. Yet again, we find we've got Yannick Sinner, Andre Rublev, Battle of the Gingers. Is Sinner going to get his revenge? I mean, he didn't even have to play. He got the best birthday present that he could hope for yesterday. Jordan Thompson said, have a buy through. I'm going to just pull out the tournament. And so Sinner didn't even have to play a match. So he's nice and fresh for his quarterfinal with Rublev, who looks back to his best again. Zverev Shelton, that's going to be a... Real entertaining one with lots of big serving. Her catch TFO. TFO looks in inspired form. And Draper Runa, which I think is the pick for me. I mean, I know we've got Sina Rublev, but that is the one I'm going to be watching. I think for me, the pick's still Sina Rublev. They played less than a week ago and Rublev beat him. Mm. Sina, we know, is not feeling his best. Was it tonsillitis? You said you know he's got a problem with his hip was, as well. Yeah, uh, there's a few other. Things. There's a few issues we've seen recently with Yannick Sinner. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting because Rublev's been in fantastic form. He lost that final in Montreal, which was very weird. Uh, the way he looked physically a bit done out then, and I didn't see all the match, but I saw Morgado tweeting during, and he was saying that Rublev physically was not there like he was struggling on during the match he seems to be okay at the moment played some good matches in Cincinnati do I see Rublev beating Sinner again it's possible I think I think Sinner 
it's not in his best way either. And usually you'd be looking at these final eight and thinking, yes, no Alcaraz there, no no Medvedev, no Djokovic, Sinema Walker. He's better than all of these players. He's one for the future. He should be able to win this. But I don't feel like that at the moment. And I would probably say the best player there, and you're going to maybe hate me for saying this, is probably Sasha Zverev. I think he is, at the moment, the player who I would fear more than all of the others. Yeah, he's definitely a, a scary, scary player. And on the faster the courts, the faster that serve comes as well. You can't remember yeah. that that match against Shelton. I'm going to be looking at that like that speed clock for the serve because I think we're going to be seeing some absolute bullets uh, in that one. But I think Zverev will beat uh, Ben Shelton uh, if we're going to make predictions. The I, I think Andre Rublev. I agree with you. I think he could be a real problem for Yannick Sinner in this match. I think that this is going to be a battle of who hits the ball cleanest. And I think Rublev's been hit, hitting the ball great. I think Sinner's only beaten Mickelson in this tournament. And I think uh, the way that Rublev's played, he beat Nakashima convincingly in the last round. He's been playing quite well recently. Quite an interest. 3.75 for Rublev. That is yes. a good bet right now. It's great value. I think it's going to be whoever's not injured will get through <laughs> it. And <laughs> just like he... not feeling ill because they they both they both have a lot of throat issues as well. So yeah, what's we'll that? Wait and tonsillitis. Didn't they say it was the kissing disease? That one. I thought they've not been giving it to each other, have they? they Gingivitis. To... <laughs> Gingival gingivitis, isn't it? <laughs> they've not been giving each other that. Right, but uh, let's get into some predictions on this because I think a few of these are going to be very close, very tough to call. I'd like to start. Uh, from the reverse. So let's start with Draper versus Luna. I think this is my favourite match, so I'm going to start off with this one. I think Holger Luna looks brilliant in this tournament. I don't think he looks as good as Jack Draper, though. I've seen a, ups and downs with Holger Luna, showing a bit of fight, but dropping sets along the way. I think Jack Draper's level just looks very, very scary. This is like a UTS matchup as well. So I think Draper is going to use that in his mind and go back to London when he won the UTS. And I think we'll we'll see Jack Draper win this. I think it will be in three sets though. Yeah, agreed completely. I've got Draper in three. Cool. Uh, your mate is back. He's no longer got a knee injury. It is Hubie Hercatch. How is he doing it? I mean... He looks like he could barely walk like a month ago. And now he's into a quarterfinal again. He's playing Francis TFO. I think this is a really good opportunity for Hubie to go a little bit further. I mean, I saw a fu I sent you a funny video yesterday. of uh, They were going around all the players asking them what their favourite karaoke songs uh, are. And Hubie's answer, I mean, just watch it. It'll crack you up. It's just typical Hubie. Uh, it reminded me of your <laughs> interview with him, the way he answered it. But yeah. Uh, I think her catch is going to win this match as well. I'm going to go her catch in three as well. Yeah, I think um, it's a tough one to call. Um, I can guarantee you a tie break or two. I yeah. feel like we're going to see a few tie breaks. I'm probably going to agree with you. I'm going to go for her catch in three as well. TFO has been very impressive. He beat Lehechka yeah. in three sets. That was very, very impressive. That's the uh, one that surprised me because I thought Lehechka actually had a chance to win this event. After beating Medvedev in the way he did. But that just goes to show TFO when he turns up. Very, very hard to beat uh, on the yeah. US hard courts. Zverev, Shelton. I'm going to be going Zverev in straight sets. Me too, yeah. Zverev in straight sets. And now the big one. This is why I put this one last. Sinner versus Rublev. Who is going to win? Is it going to be revenge for Yannick Sinner or is it going to be Andre Rublev? I'm going to go for Andre Rublev to beat him again. And I'm going to be going for Andre Rublev in three sets. Okay, so finally we do differ uh, because I'm having Yannick Sinner winning this one. Uh, yeah, I really believe he's going to do it. I think it's going to be tight. It's going to be a 7-5, 7-5 or something like that. And it's going to be Yannick Sinner straight sets. Wow. I mean, I think it all depends on how well Andre Rublev serves. But in his last uh, match, he won 88% of his first serves, but only 68% of them in. If he gets more first serves in, Sinner could be in trouble. That's my personal Definitely. opinion. Right. 
Well, let's wrap that one up. That is another episode done. We will bring you some of the women's reaction and give you some of the thoughts on some of the quarterfinals that play today. We'll do that a bit later on. Um, but anything else left to say, JG? Yeah, I just want you to give me your pick now based off the final eight, who you think is going to win the whole thing. I've already inc- given you an incline. I think Zverev could surprise some people and he's the one who I'm really scared of. He can also yeah. let you down as well, but I like Zverev's chances and I have a feeling he is going to win Cincinnati. Uh, what's your pick? I'm I'm shying towards the same thing. I, I have to say, he bear in mind, if he wins this, he goes up to number two in the world. He will be the second seed at the US Open if he wins this. That is a massive thing. So I think with that in his like crosshairs, I think he's a hard man to stop when he's playing well, Sasha Zverev. Yeah, agree. So we, we both think him. <laughs> Let us know in the comments He's not section. not going to win now. <laughs> um, me and Ben are very much in agreement on this episode. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, do you agree West Ham are going to win later as well? I mean, I've done my Super 6 uh, and I've gone for a 1-1 one, one draw. So I don't uh, know. I know. Sorry. Fair enough. To a doubt, a I mean, I'll take, I'll take a draw as well. Uh, but anyway, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll try and bring you more daily episodes from now on in because there's so much going on in the tennis world. And (laughs) I mean, we could have done another half an hour, I think. So thank you for watching. Make sure if you haven't already, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, and join us on Spotify where all of our audio podcasts are as well. Uh, See you very soon. That's it.